Thank you for joining us today. This is the Western Michigan University Cooley Law Review Symposium. We will be talking about qualified immunity and police reform. My name is Katrina Davis. I'm the executive symposium editor, and we are so happy um, everybody decided to join us this evening. This event will be moderated by the one and only Professor Anthony Flores, and I'll let him take it from here. Thank you, Katrina. Welcome to the Western Michigan University Cooley Law School Qualified Immunity Police Reform Symposium. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about what we're going to do here and then um, and then get started. Uh, thank you for all coming. Thank you for coming. Uh, when I initially agreed to do this and I dove into qualified immunity, I had known something about it. I had no idea that the law review had picked such a uh, growing and budding topic to speak of. Um, so there's a lot here. There's a there's a lot here to talk about. Um, I'm going to I'm going to give some initial uh, addresses about a little bit about qualified immunity where it came from, and then I will uh, I will uh, I will uh, go to uh, introducing the panel, and from there uh, the making sure my sorry about this I'm making sure my my uh, place is correct where I can see everybody. Um, and then I will introduce the panel. We have a wonderful panel to talk to you today uh, about some of these topics. Uh, and then the keynote speaker, who's uh, uh, Washtenaw County Prosecutor Elect uh, Ellie Sabat, will be uh, will be giving the keynote address. And then we'll be taking questions as the panel afterwards uh, concerning this topic. Um, so to introduce myself once again, my name is Anthony Flores. I was an assistant prosecutor uh, in mid-Michigan for 15 years before coming to Cooley in 2005. I teach criminal law, criminal procedure, and evidence here. Um, I, I have uh, somewhat of an experience with qualified immunity through, uh, through almost 30 years of criminal law, uh, being a criminal law lawyer. Uh, and so uh, where did it come from? Where does this concept of criminal law come, uh, of qualified immunity comes from? And it really comes to us from several legislative acts uh, that started in 1871 that go through 1983, and I'm not going to bore you with the, the details and the history of it, because those of you have to take me, have to take me, and those of you don't, don't want to hear it now. So, you know, and I see a lot, I, I see too many people smiling at that joke, and it's not that funny. Um, but, but you, you students know, I really, I really think this is, this is a, a really unique time so that we can discuss some of these issues. Qualified immunity began, began as a, a modest, a modest uh, uh, protection of law enforcement to, to make sure that the, those who acted in good faith were not seen as responsible for actions that were not unreasonable and from the Supreme Court. And then it grew from there. And it, 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 it took on a life of its own uh, in regards to the test for qualified immunity and in regards to what the test has become as the Supreme Court now decides what to take, what cases to take, and and how and how to make an ana analysis of qualified immunity, um, and it has come to a point in time with our social justice reform and holding law enforcement accountable for actions, so to speak, uh, as as we continue and evolve in our criminal justice system, uh, that that we've come to a crossroads where really there is bipartisan support on some level across the aisle concerning this issue of qualified immunity and police reform. Uh, nothing is more apparent than our, our Supreme Court justices now who have been critical of, of, of the analysis, the current analysis that they use within qualified immunity. It has been criticized by Clarence Thomas. It has also been criticized by the Honorable uh, Justice Sotomayor. Both of those things are ongoing as we look at how we're going to look at this issue of qual uh, qualified immunity. There's also a very little known exception for qualified immunity called uh, the fair warning doctrine that is almost never used in regards or rarely used that the, that the Supreme Court uses as part of its analysis. Bigger than that topic is this idea that law enforcement should be held accountable and that there should be some type of of, of, of ability to hold the law enforcement accountable 
and to be able to use the courts to protect yourself in that regard. And that's part of the conversation we have now. Um, you don't want to hear any more from me about this. You want to hear from our panelists. I, I, think, I, I think I've set the stage for what I think is a pretty exciting topic. Uh, so I will, I will introduce our panel that we have today. We're going to answer questions. I'm going to start. Some of these people I get to call friends, so I'm so lucky in that regard. Uh, Professor Emeritus uh, Marla Mitchell Seishan. Uh, I can't say enough things about Marla, um, uh, Professor Seishan. She was the director of the Innocence Project. She's bestowed. She's been bestowed more awards than I can probably count. Um, her contribution to the legal profession is enormous, and bigger than that, she's been involved in the exoneration of incarcerated individuals. She's fought her whole career for it. Uh, so, one our first panel member is Professor Marla Mitchell Seishan. Um, Marla, do you want to say anything? I know you were having some difficulties with tech difficulties before. Did you want to say anything? I'm uh, just glad to see everybody here and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mitchell Seishan. Second of our panelists is Harold Love. He's retired uh, law enforcement at Michigan State Police, retired uh, as a captain, uh, retired as commander of the Commercial Vehicle Division. Uh, he is currently licensed as a uh, professional counselor. He has worked in combination with health clinicians and behavioral scientists uh, for public safety professionals. Uh, it's 25 years, I believe, as a Michigan State uh, police officers. Um, Mr. Love, thank you for being on the panel. And do you have anything to say? Thank you, Tony. Uh, good evening, everyone. Yes, I, I served 25 years and worked all over Southern Lower Michigan in different capacities from trooper to captain. And 14 and a half of my 25 were spent here in Southeast Michigan. So I've uh, worked a lot of critical incidents, uh, high profile incidents. And now in my practice, I serve public safety professionals, helping them basically learn how to take care of themselves better and also uh, doing uh, psychological screenings and that sort. So glad to be a part of the discussion. Looking forward to it. Thank you, Mr. Love. Finally, uh, but but not least, we also have uh, ret a retired MSP, uh, Michigan State Police, uh, uh, but also Cooley grad, uh, Governor's Council, uh, has taught criminal procedure, criminal law, and evidence at Cooley Law School. Uh, I'm lucky to call him a friend. Uh, he's a much better golfer than I am, so I always say that when I introduce him because I, I seem to be doing that a lot these days. Uh, but the, uh, the last member of our panel, law enforcement experience, public defender experience with the Washington Public Defender's Office, and, and then uh, is also taught at the Mid Michigan Police Academy, uh, prof uh, Professor Emeritus Lou Langham. Thank you, Tony. I am glad to be here uh, just to be on the panel. Um, probably the most important thing that Tony said is that I am a much better golfer. So I'm looking <laughs> forward to I'm looking forward uh, to being a part of the panel. Um, I think it's going to be an interesting uh, subject that we're going to be talking about today. So looking forward. Thank you. Um, now, uh, now, without any uh, uh, further uh, further taking up your time, I will have uh, somebody from the law review introduce our keynote speaker. Uh, uh, Mr. Ellie Savitt, uh, who is the, the Washtenaw County prosecutor elect, and uh, we'll go from there. Hello, everyone, and thank you again for joining us tonight. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Silvana Reed, and I am the editor in chief of the law review. Um, this symposium is something that I've been personally excited about for quite some time. Um, the entire reason I decided to take the leap after much deliberation um, and finally begin law school was because as a woman of color, I was tired of hearing story after story of people who looked like me and my family being brutalized by law enforcement in the media. I was tired of watching documentaries about wrongful convictions where people served decades in prison for crimes they didn't commit. And I decided I needed to do something about it. So. I came to law school with the hopes of one day being a public defender. And I share all of this to show that the high praise that I have for our keynote speaker tonight is well deserved. I never in my life thought that I would be proud, let alone inspired by a prosecutor. Um, but when I first heard that Ellie Sabat was running for Washtenaw County prosecutor, I was totally hooked. He was running on a campaign of um, reforming the cash bail system. And that was, in fact, one of the very first policy decisions he made after he took office, that the prosecutor's office would no longer seek cash bail in any case. 
Um, he's followed that up with additional policies, including declining to collaborate with ICE or federal immigration enforcement to ensure the safety of everyone in the community and ensure that justice is carried out even handedly, irrespective of citizenship status, um, no longer prosecuting the use or possession of uh, buprenorphine, um, which is commonly known as Suboxone, um, because it's a tremendously effective medication that can aid in recovery, prevent people from using more dangerous drugs. Um, he's no longer prosecuting consensual sex work as the cr criminalization of sex work actually increases the risk of harm to sex workers and no longer prosecuting contraband cases that arise from pretext stops, which are heavily associated with racial profiling and data shows that black motorists are significantly more likely to be the subject of pretext stops than white people. Um, as prosecutor, Ellie has joined nearly 100 criminal justice leaders to urge President Biden to take immediate and definitive steps to end the federal death penalty. He's partnered with Fair Michigan, one of Michigan's leading LGBTQ advocacy, education, and outreach organizations to expand the project to Washtenaw County and started the Prosecutor Transparency Project, a first of its kind partnership in the state of Michigan geared towards looking at potential race inequalities in the prosecutor's office and taking action to eliminate inequitable treatment. So clearly um, he is on the cutting edge and providing a precedent for how um, prosecution should be done across this nation. And I'm very excited um, that he is now in Washtenaw County. And without further ado, I'm very proud and excited to be able to introduce him as tonight's keynote speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much, Silvana. It's uh, it, it's an honor to uh, to be here. Uh, and what Silvana didn't didn't tell you is that uh, she actually helped craft some of those uh, policies. She volunteered for our transition working groups, uh, which were done in uh, coordination with with over 170 folks from across our community, law enforcement, survivors, advocates, uh, civil liberties, lawyers, public defenders, prosecutors, uh, neighborhood leaders, faith leaders. We really are about uh, doing everything together. And, and, and so, Silvana, you should pat yourself on the back for all the all the volunteer work that you did uh, in addition to being a law student uh on uh, on that um so i'm so i'm really thrilled to be here today uh and uh, you, you know i want to contextualize the issue of qualified immunity within the broader issue of uh, policing in our country and of the trust that i think we all want uh to have in law enforcement uh obviously issues of policing and particularly the policing of communities of color are front and center right now. Uh, you know, the killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Eric Garner, Philando Castile, Tamir Rice, countless, countless others have sparked the largest civil rights movement in the nation's history. Uh, we've all seen the videos, we've marched in the streets, but, but I want to focus my remarks today on the legal structures that uh, have, have in a lot of ways led to this point, what we can do to change them, and also uh, close by talking about the, the role of elected prosecutors and district attorneys um, in uh, hopefully making sure that we can uh, move past uh, this period of time and uh, start to re rebuild and regain uh, trust uh, between law enforcement and the communities they, they serve. Uh, and I do want to start with qualified immunity because I know that that's the big uh, the big topic for today's panel. Um, the background is is this: the Civil Rights Act of 1871, uh, also known as the as the Ku Klux Klan Act, Congress gave Americans the right to sue public officials who violate their legal rights, and and you can recover uh, damages in some cases for uh, the violations of your of your statutory or constitutional. Right uh, now, uh, of course, uh, this was something that applied to all public officials. It was not something that was geared specifically towards law enforcement, but it often comes up in the law enforcement uh, context, uh, both both uh, police, but also uh, you, you, you know folks that work in prisons or in jails, because so many constitutional rights are attendant to those interactions. Uh, the Fourth Amendment, for example, prohibits against uh, unreasonable searches and seizures. Uh, use of excessive force in arrest and the like. Of course, the Eighth Amendment um, prohibits cruel and unusual punishment. And so you get a lot of uh, 
cases under uh, what, what is now called Section 1983, that's the vehicle for bringing these suits uh, under the Civil Rights Act uh, that, that allege mistreatment by prison guards or jailers uh, and, and the like. But it is something that applies to all governmental officials. The, the, the point is that there should be some remedy at the back end if a government official violates your rights. And, and so that's how things stood really, really for nearly a century. Uh, but then uh, in, in in 1967, the Supreme Court of the United States, uh, and, and, and I'm saying this uh, <laughs> nicely, but they basically invented qualified immunity. It is a judicially uh, created doctrine. It doesn't have its basis uh, in uh, in the Constitution. There's nothing about it specifically in the statute, but they, they invented qualified immunity and they described it initially as, as, a, as a really sort of modest and narrow uh, exception for public officials who acted in good faith uh, and believed their conduct was authorized by law. The idea idea there is that you know public officials should have some a little bit of leeway in making their decisions without fearing lawsuits that could uh, you know potentially bankrupt them and their 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 families because otherwise you know you, you couldn't do anything right uh, you you would be unable to uh, make a decision one way or the other if you're always fearing lawsuit so so okay so far as it goes uh, I suppose but but then 15 years later the Supreme Court really turbocharged uh, this doctrine of qualified immunity. And they said that uh, what a, a officer or a public official, including police officers, are immune from from lawsuit uh, unless the the, uh, the the person who is suing can show that the right that was violated was quote unquote clearly established. Now, in the aftermath of that, uh, the, the the United States Courts of Appeals and the United States Supreme Court uh, have, have done with this clearly established doctrine is made qualified immunity uh, uh, a, a really virtually impenetrable shield, um, which is which is significant evolution from how it was originally conceptualized by the Supreme Court as a sort of modest um, uh, exception for public officials that acted in good faith. They have said, look, something is not clearly established uh, as a violation of somebody's rights pretty much unless there is a a case directly on point, a binding uh, case that uh, involves really the same exact facts. The idea there uh, to be to be charitable to 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 the courts is, you know, how are public officials to know if there's not something that's like on all fours with uh, the the situation that was presented to them. But this is, you know, th this has really led to uh, some some results that that I think. Um, uh, uh, really go beyond what most people would think of as being reasonable. Uh, for example, uh, you might say, well, there might be a binding court decision that says, well, it is um, uh, it is unconstitutional for a police officer to handcuff a seven-year-old uh, or, or a seven-year-old at school and take them to the back of the squad car. And then you have a case that involves an eight-year-old and they say, well, you know, uh, we said seven in the previous case. Uh, the eight-year-old's a little bit older, so no so, so, so we can't uh, hold the the officer accountable there. There's qualified immunity, even if it might be a constitutional violation. And what's worse about this doctrine is that it prevents the evolution of constitutional law as well. Because what courts can do is they can just say, well, um, this wasn't a clearly established violation. Uh, and so we don't even have to issue a ruling on the underlying constitutional issue. So in that case that I mentioned with the eight-year-old, uh, right, I mean, there, it may be a constitutional violation, uh, ultimately, the court might actually think that, but because they can get rid of the case and courts generally don't want to do any more than is necessary to resolve the case, they, because they can just get rid of the case on uh, the qualified immunity aspect, they never reach the constitutional issue. And so then the next time an eight-year-old uh, is handcuffed and put into the back of a, of, of, of a squad car, uh, it's the same thing. Well, still no uh, binding, uh, clearly established law on this point. So, so qualified immunity has effectively been used to shield, uh, you know, again, largely but not entirely, uh, police officers and uh, 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 correctional employees uh, from civil liability for suit. Uh, again, it does 
clearly uh, apply to all public officials, but it most often comes up in that context. And in in my view, and in the, in, in the view of many others, uh, uh, this is this is a problem. But but it's not the only uh, issue. Uh, it is a problem because it ultimately relates, quite frankly, to how officers are trained and the standards that they are held to by their employers. The truth of the matter is, uh, uh, a public official is very rarely going to be personally liable for losing a lawsuit that arose out of their official uh, duties, because usually they have what's called an indemnification clause. Uh, which says that their employer is on the hook for any judgment that uh, is is uh, that, that that goes against them. So the, it's ultimately the city, the county, uh, the state, whoever that pays out the money if they lose this lawsuit. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's not so much a disincentive for officers because they fear civil suit. What it what it has done, in my view, is it's uh, it's really stymied uh, training that is uh, geared towards preventing constitutional abuses because uh, you, you you have this broad swath and uh, communities. And, and look, I'm, I'm not saying all uh, jurisdictions do this poorly. Some communities are, are really cognizant of making sure that, that officers have good training and know how to avoid even uh, a a snip at a constitutional violation, but they don't have skin in the game. Uh, if they had skin in the game on this, if they were potentially going to be liable for civil suit, they would have a lot more incentive to make absolutely certain that law enforcement officers on the ground uh, know uh, th that what the Constitution protects and also know, you know, what what may be a constitutional violation, even if it's not something that was expressly decided by, uh, you know, the, the, the United States Supreme Court or a Court of Appeals in that jurisdiction. Now, uh, the thing about this is, and you and, and you hear these uh, these calls to abolish qualified immunity all the time. Uh, the, remember, I said this is a judicially created doctrine. Uh, it can be changed. All of this stems from the statute that Congress passed back in 1871. And so, if Congress wants to add to that statute a standard which um, either reinstates a much more modest qualified immunity doctrine or get rid of qualified immunity altogether, it can always do that. This is not something that's constitutional. It was something that was judicially created uh, as part of a uh, interpretation of a statute. And so Congress can always over override it. Um, but it bears emphasis too that qualified immunity is just one part of the puzzle. There's a lot of focus on qualified immunity, but qualified immunity, again, only gets to the civil lawsuit that may uh, occur at the back end of uh, an interaction between a member of the public and a public official. It doesn't deal with, uh, for example, a police's fundamental powers to make stops, to perform investigations, to search, and, and so forth. And that's yet another piece of the puzzle, because the truth of the matter is the Supreme Court uh, of the United States has given police extraordinarily expansive powers that in some cases, I mean, the data really clearly shows, have been used in racially disproportionate uh, ways. Uh, and, and I want to talk about that for a second, because look, we know that racially disproportionate uh, policing and racially disproportionate um, outcomes occur in our criminal legal system. Uh, black people and people of color are far more likely to uh, come on police's radar than white people. And, and just a couple of statistics. Uh, the United States of America locks up more people per capita than any country on the face of the planet. And black people are approximately six times as likely as white people to uh, be incarcerated. Uh, and a lot of this stems from disproportionate arrests, and we can take, um, uh, we, we, we know about this because, uh, take marijuana, for example. We know that marijuana usage rates are roughly equal uh, as among all races, uh, white, black, wh whatever. Uh, but the data clearly shows that uh, black people and people of color are significantly more likely to be arrested for a marijuana-based offense than uh, are white people. In the state of Michigan, according to an analysis done by the ACLU in 2018, uh, you are uh, 4.7 times more likely to be arrested for marijuana, this is before legalization, um, but 4.7 times more likely if you are black than if you are white. Uh, and a lot of this, frankly, comes out of, um, of, of motor vehicle stops uh, and racial profiling. And you know, the data on this is pretty clear. There's been a nationwide study of over 200 million traffic stop records that indicate black motorists are significantly more likely than white motorists to be stopped for a traffic violation. Uh, once they are stopped, they're significantly more likely to be searched for contraband. And uh, police require less suspicion to search uh, for contraband for Hispanic drivers and black drivers than uh, white drivers. 
Uh, now, what accounts for uh, all of this? Well, it's a couple of uh, a series of Supreme Court decisions uh, again, uh, where where we see uh, racial profiling occurring in in the system is uh, it follows often a a, a pretty familiar fact pattern. Uh, a person is pulled over uh, for a minor traffic violation, uh, failing to use a turn signal, uh, you know, going a little bit over the speed limit, uh, whatever, uh, and. Uh, they are um, uh, then asked by a law enforcement officer, uh, do you mind if I just look around your car a little bit? Uh, you don't have any drugs or weapons on you. Uh, you wouldn't mind if I just like looked around to, to, to make sure. Uh, and if you give the consent under the Fourth Amendment, it doesn't matter if there's any suspicion uh, that you actually have something in the car. Consent is a reason standing on its own to search uh, the vehicle. Uh, and the reason for, for, for that, 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 that really incentivizes in some ways uh, racial profiling is because the Supreme Court of the United States uh, d decided in a, in a decision called Wren that that a police officer can pull you over uh, for any reason at all, uh, including just because they want to, uh, you know, search for uh, drugs or search for for weapons without any reasonable suspicion uh, or any suspicion at all. So long as after the fact they can point to some reason for the search. So the officer's subjective motivation doesn't matter at all. And that's been expanded in a series of uh, cases, uh, really culminating in in a Supreme Court decision in 2000 and. 14, I believe it was called Hind versus North Carolina, in which the Supreme Court said, uh, you know, an officer doesn't even have to be right about the law after the fact that they uh, say justified the stop. They can have a reasonable mistake that, uh, of the law. Uh, so what you were doing in your car may not actually even be illegal. You, you know, the, uh, the, the turn signal uh, may not have even been illegally uh, off. Uh, and they can still stop you so long as it was reasonable. This gives a great deal of discretion to uh, to, to to officers, of course. And uh, you know, unfortunately, the data suggests that it is often used in a way that perpetuates these racial inequities. Now, uh, again, it doesn't have to be like this, uh, because in the states of Washington and New Mexico, uh, they have uh, constitutional protections against these so-called pretext stops, which are often um, uh, a cover for racial profiling. They say the officer's subjective motivation does indeed matter, and the officer can't pull you over for a pretextual reason. Uh, there's been no evidence that in Washington and New Mexico there's any more crime, uh, that it makes it harder for police officers to solve crimes. But uh, if you make that the state of the law, uh, you, you can take a lot of racial profiling off the table. And most importantly, uh, you can really make sure that um, uh, law enforcement officers are able to uh, build a trust in the community and that community members, uh, when they're pulled over for a traffic violation, if they're, if they're black, if they're people, of color that they know, uh, okay, this is just about the traffic violation. It's not a fishing expedition to search for something else. That is tremendously important because look, I, I've been pulled over. Uh, I am really horrible at using those like roundabouts that for some reason we have in Michigan uh, now. I think we should keep those in Europe where they where they started. Uh, but I get pulled over in those all the time. Um, uh, if there's any Washington law enforcement officers, please don't uh, pull me over in, in a roundabout. But, uh, but you know, look, I'm a white guy. And and so I get pulled over and I, I'm, an, I'm annoyed. I'm frustrated with myself that I still can't figure out how to use these roundabouts. I'm annoyed I got pulled over. It's a, it, you know, I, I, I don't want to particularly pay the ticket, but I've never have to think, uh, is this just a, a pretext for something else? And so, you know, those, those interactions that I have with law enforcement, uh, they're fine. Uh, sometimes I get let off, with, let off with a warning. Sometimes I get a ticket. Um, I might drive away a little bit annoyed, but I never fear that this is a cover, that the reason that the lights were flashing in the background are cover for something else. And so we should all want that to be the case for everybody in our community, uh, because when there's there's the fear and and the degradation, frankly, that you know you've been pulled over just driving home from work uh, by by an officer who's really looking for something more, that causes that interaction to be a lot more tense. Just necessarily, it does, and that puts both the civilian safety at risk and the law enforcement officer's uh, safety at risk. So, in my view, we need legal structures that are in place that uh, disincentivize, like in Washington and New Mexico 
Mexico, uh, pretext stops and racial profiling because it makes us all safer. The, the, the other point on that is this. We have a, a situation right now where there is a significant distrust. Um, uh, and this is, this is no surprise to, to, to anybody between uh, uh, communities of color and law enforcement. Uh, and in a lot of cases that makes folks less likely to cooperate or to report crimes to law enforcement. If we rebuild that trust and doing so uh, may require changing the legal structures that govern law enforcement, it will make us safer in the long term because when you trust law enforcement, you feel more comfortable going to them if you're the victim of a crime, if you're a witness to a crime, if you have something to report, which is what we all should want. Uh, so this gets to the role uh, of, of, of prosecutors uh, and uh, prosecutors do have a role to play in all of this because, uh, you, you know, uh, Silvana mentioned this at, at, at the top, we adopted a policy that said, look, uh, we're not interested in low level charges, possession of contraband charges that arise uh, under the, the, the sort of situation that I just described. Officer pulls somebody over for a minor traffic violation, no other suspicion, and they and they use that as uh, to gain consent to search the car. We said, look, we're not, we're not interested in this. Now, obviously, uh, an investigatory stop, they suspect somebody of a crime, and that's why they pulled them over. They've got reasonable suspicion to search. Uh, bring the case to us. That's a different matter. If they see something in plain sight, we're not telling you ignore. Like, uh, we we don't want you to. to to see a gun and, um, you know, potentially uh, say, well, maybe that was used as a, as a murder weapon. All that is all that is in a different category, but just pulling somebody over plus consent to search the car. We're not interested in the low level contraband charges that arise from that. And in so doing, we're sort of playing our part. And I have to say in Washtenaw County, we have great law enforcement partners to work with. Uh, you know, we, we, we talk to all of our uh, local police chiefs and sheriffs about this, uh, and they're as committed to rooting out uh, racial profiling and pretextual stuff as we are because, because they realize, look, it really undermines the trust in the communities that we serve. So prosecutors can play a role in this. Prosecutors can play a role by saying, look, uh, we don't we, we don't want these cases. We don't want to be prosecuting them, disincentivizing them. We can also play a role uh, by doing things like making sure uh, that we're that, that we're reviewing all evidence before you know uh, charging somebody uh, in in a, in, a, in a case, so people have the the knowledge that uh, you know if they're if they're being charged, it's uh, it, it is is it legitimate that the evidence is there. We should all want to get it right. Um, and, you know, with respect to police violence too, we've, uh, we adopted a policy, which is consistent with the best practices recommended by civil liberties groups across the country, uh, in which we said, look, if there's an incident of police violence in this, in this county, we are referring it out for, to an outside special prosecutor, because we're just necessarily too close to law enforcement in our community. You may uh, have somebody who's accused of, of. Uh, using excessive force one day, and then the next day uh, need to go in with that person's partner as a witness in a case. It really puts you in a in a tough position as prosecutor. So we said, look, we're going to have a special prosecutor come from outside of the county uh, to to look at this, so that. The community knows that justice is being done, that there's no uh, favoritism or bias in the system or in our prosecution. And again, I'll just close by saying we should all want this. We are at a point in our country right now where the trust in law enforcement uh, among the communities that we serve, many of the communities that we serve, is really at an all-time low. That doesn't help anybody. That doesn't keep us safer. I respect the, 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 the really trying and dangerous job that law enforcement officers do uh, every day. And it's my view that by uh, putting these policies into place and by uh, changing some of the legal structures that have facilitated some, some of the um, mistrust that we've seen in this country over the past hundred years, uh, we can rebuild that trust. We can make our communities safer for everybody. And ultimately that is what we all should want. Thank you, uh, Mr. Savitt. Um, I think uh, I think we'll we'll turn it over to the panel now. I know I know we have some questions, but I'll turn it over to the the panel now. Um, but if anybody wants to enter a question in the chat for us to for the panel to talk about uh, uh, or raise their hand, uh, and I have some help, so people will be uh, you know uh, will be helping me. Um, uh, it, it'll help kind of the blurting out. Um, uh, Mr. Savitt, you do have one question from one of our uh, one of our students, and they wanted to know what it was like to clerk 
uh, for uh, for Justice Ginsburg. <laughs> well, I could I, I could tell Justice Ginsburg stories all, all day, um, but 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 you know it was it was the honor of a lifetime. Uh, you know she is such a legal giant, even though she was only about four foot eleven. Uh, we, when we took her like our official, you, you get like an official portrait when you clerk for a justice. And they, I, I'm six foot four. They actually had to move the camera back to get us both in the both in the frame. Um, but you know, Justice Ginsburg was was somebody uh, that was of course a, a brilliant legal mind. But she also kept uh, the the human beings that were at the center of every case front and center in her mind. W one of the the most uh, dominant memories in my mind uh, of of Justice Ginsburg, which which I I thought about over and over again after she passed, was uh, she was a she was a night owl. She she worked until like four or five in the morning. And if you were working with her on a on a case, you were you were going to be uh, in there in the Supreme Court building uh, working with her until she decided to go home and go to sleep. Uh, so it was late one Friday night, and I was working with her on something, going back and forth on a case, and I'd have to like run run papers down to her office. And uh, it was like the last draft of something we were working on together. And she was sitting working on another case. Uh, and this was not in any way a high profile case. Most people probably have never heard of this case uh, at all. It's not one of the Supreme Court cases that makes the front page of the New York Times. Uh, it was just, you know, one of the minor cases that uh, the justices decide every year. And she was working really hard and she was so concerned about the case. And she just started talking to me. It wasn't even the case that, uh, a case that I was assigned to. She started talking to me about uh, the people in the case. And how this Im that this ruling was going to impact their lives and how, uh, you know, justice was going to be done and how their lives are going to be able to get back on track because of what the court system did. That's that's something that I think is is, uh, you know, all too often forgotten about at the appellate level, uh, because you're sort of sitting, uh, especially at the Supreme Court in this marble palace and all the uh, the arguments are on paper and everything like that. And you don't see like the, the litigants usually in in the courtroom. Uh, they're you know they they got their appellate lawyer and uh they present the this sort of abstract legal argument but but you know despite having been a, a federal judge and a supreme court justice for um uh you know over 30 years at that point uh, justice ginsburg had never forgotten um that there are human beings at the center of every case and kept their needs and uh their their need for justice front and center in everything she did and that was that was her i mean that was her as a as a as a litigator it was her as a as a justice Justice. She viewed the law as something that could be a powerful tool to make people's lives better. And, you know, that's that, that's something that I hold uh, in my heart and I, I take with me. Um, and that's that's going to be her legacy uh, moving forward. Thank you so much for that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Savitt. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Marla, Professor Marla Mitchell Seishan. Uh, any comments? concerning some of the remarks that our speakers made. Uh, I know you have strong feelings about this based on your work. Uh, what can you share with us? Well, I think I think two things that um, Mr. Savitt said are really, really important for us to think about as we have our discussion tonight. One is, is that um, he pointed out that qualified immunity is really addressing the problem on the back end. For, you know, a law enforcement officer or even a prosecutor have been sued. And really, that's not a long term solution, right? We need to solve the problems on the front end. And I think he he um, he emphasized that really well. And I think a lot of folks, um, you know, in the work that I do, we are actually seeing the misconduct, right? And it's affecting an innocent, per an innocent person's life and they're in prison. And the idea or the goal is to put me or an innocence program out of business. Um, we should not exist. Innocent people should not be going to prison. And police um, and sometimes prosecutorial misconduct um, affects about 35 to 40 percent of all wrongful convictions. Uh, Mr. Love, do you have any comments, uh, follow up comments? No, I appreciate the perspective. Uh... You know that that speaker brought forth um, one thing that he talked about skin in the game, you know, and accountability. I think that is a huge issue. Um, we have uh, a lot of, as he said, a lot of good departments out there, a lot of good leaders in those departments, uh, but there are some that uh, do not hold people accountable, um, and because of that, um, bad behavior is condoned, or the appearance is that it's condoned. If it's condoned, then it's, it's not condemned. And uh, if there's no accountability, no skin in the game, 
then the behavior continues. Um, and sometimes it goes uh, too far to where someone has lost their life. And then you have an officer going to jail, um, you know, for the rest of his or her life. Uh, so I appreciate those comments and um, look forward to, to talking about it more. Mr. Love, I, I, and your, your, your prior law enforcement perspective, um, we have a student who's asked, and, and this was kind of broached on by both uh, Professor Seishen, uh, 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 Mitchell Seishen, and by Mr. Sabat. Um, what is, what is a mechanism or a mechanism from law enforcement's perspective to stop uh, some of the implicit bias from, uh, from law enforcement feeling authorized that they can use this as a mechanism to make stops? Although they may not even know it, or they do it intrinsically, making stops on uh, those of color. Uh, and I'll, I'll pose that question to you, and then to uh, to Professor Langham, uh, because both of you have law enforcement experience. Yeah, I I think good cultural competence training, you know, understanding uh, why that's an issue, why there is a fear among members of the black community of of being stopped by the police. Um, there are a lot of mechanisms that are already out there and available to uh, police departments and it takes a, a good strong leader to make sure that they're pushing those things down down the line you know helping to again uh, increase that cultural competence among their, their workforce and then uh, you know having just continuous training and reiterating why um, you know the, the the contextual stops are, are, are you know our pretext stops are are not necessarily a good thing um, and I say necessarily a good thing because sometimes um, you know, you get that that sixth sense or something that there's something going on. I think the prosecutor spoke on that. You know, he's not talking about those things when you just you know that there's crime afoot. But using something um, like a burnt out a license plate light or a dangling ornament just to get into a car because I want to see uh, what I can get out of this car. You know, I'm going to get something out of the car. That's a common common theme, a common thread. You know, common statement that you hear. Um, and, you know, it's just acceptable practice. So from a leadership standpoint, there has to be um, an, a constant emphasis on the importance of police and community trust and how we need that trust in order to do our jobs effectively as law enforcement officers. Professor Langham, do you have any comments? Yeah, I, I just wanted to point out, I appreciate the uh, prosecutor talking about uh, pretext stops and how it can relate actually to implicit bias as well. I mean, because we know, and, and, and he brought that out in the pretext stops, that we know that, that the states can grant you uh, more protections than the actual Constitution allows. Um, and that's what these pretext stops kind of can get around. If, if, and, and what he's doing in his county is, is, is a good thing. Um, we learned it, um, and, 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 some, and as you know, Professor Poise, and, and our teachings in Michigan State Police versus SITS, and we had the sobriety check lanes in, in, in Michigan. Um, and I used to participate in sobriety check lanes where we would set up on the side of the road and stop every car coming down that particular road for, you know, a minute or two, um, just to see whether or not they were, had been drinking alcohol drinking and, and they smelled of alcohol. And, um, and even though um, it was determined to be constitutional that police officers could do that in the state of Michigan, the state of Michigan decided, well, that's good. Everyone else now does it, but Michigan doesn't do that because um, more protections have been provided to Michigan citizens. So sobriety check lanes are no longer um, legal here in the state of Michigan. They haven't been for a long, long time. Um, as it relates to um, implicit bias, um, I think one of the things, and, 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 um, and Professor Flores and I both teach at the Mid Michigan Police Academy, and it, and it truly, truly provides us with um, an opportunity that we take to, uh, total advantage of um, when we're training um, police cadets. Um, and, and, and we get an opportunity to talk about civil rights in Section 1983, and we get a chance to talk about implicit bias um, in those courses. And, 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 and trying to educate cadets at that beginning stage, you know, what are the right things to do? And, and, and what are, you know, I don't know what you've been told or what you haven't been told. And I always tell them, I try to make sure that uh, I don't step on any of the other instructors toes, but I tell them, you need to make decisions. You know what the right thing is to do. You know what the legal thing is to do. 
Um, you have just as much police authority as your, if your lieutenant is telling you to do something as a police officer, um, and if it's not legal, you should not do it. it, it it's, it's, they have no more police authority than you. They have more rank than you, but they have no more police authority than you do. So you, you kind of have to roll all of that information in. And I think um, Professor um, Session kind of mentioned it. Do some of these things on the front end. Um, and, 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 and the front end for what I do is in, in teaching and in, in law school courses and teaching um, police cadets on the front end so that we don't have to address some of these issues that uh, down the line that are illegal or just flat out wrong. I, I'll, I'll pose this next question out. I'm going to paraphrase the question from the student on getting law enforcement and something as which Professor Langham just spoke about. Um, but it'd be this this cultural change of guardian versus warrior uh, change in that you, you uh, I think I think in Canada they, they call it uh, people who help people. That's the law enforcement slogan, which I, I really like that. Um, the uh, there's this change of culture in the department that needs to happen in order to see to see uh, at the ground level. We were talking we are talking about qualified immunity, but since we started this ground level conversation. Um, and Marla, you, you're talking about this is critical to something you do on the back end, and I'd like to hear about that. Well, yeah, I, I appre appreciate what Professor Langham and and you do in terms of teaching. But if if these young cadets go back into the police force, and um, you know misconduct is um, either ignored or in some some environments supported. Um, or encouraged, then I think, you know, it defeats the point. It's, it's a lot to ask of a young cadet not to follow the order of his or her senior officer. So it, 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 it has, you know, education is the answer to almost everything. <laughs> almost every social problem can be improved through education, right? But then there has to be resources and there has to be support, um, you know, from, from the, the, I guess, the top down, right? And um, I think that, you know, you, you see that already, I think, in the, the prosecutorial culture, um, you know, 20 years ago, law students did not have the opportunity to work in an innocence project and see the harm that one case can do to an individual. It ruins an individual's entire life, sometimes when they're 17, 18, 19 year old young black men. And when you have that experience, it, it sticks with you the rest of your career. Right? So, if you're a law enforcement officer, or you're a prosecutor, when you go into those roles and you've seen those things firsthand, you are the future and you are changing the culture. And I think that's happening both um, in prosecutors offices at, as well as police departments. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, Mr. Love, I guess I'd like your, you've got a background in, in not only law enforcement, but psychology. And so you see, you see some of the, um, the. The, the needs of a cultural change on some level. I guess I, I'd ask you to speak to that. Well, yeah, so I, I get a lot of officers who either come to me by themselves or are sent to me for behavioral issues. Um, they're starting to get uh, citizen complaints. Uh, they're grumpy. They're uh, kind of defying uh, leadership and management and supervision and things like that. And when we talk about cumulative stress, uh, officers are involved in critical incident stress, traumatic incident stress. We see a lot on a daily basis. But one of the, I think the um, the factors that contribute to stress the most is organizational stress. And this is one that we don't talk about. But working in a culture where, you know, you come into a profession to help, to serve. I always wanted to be a cop. This is what I hear when I'm doing these pre-employment psychological evaluations. But then you get into a culture where bad behavior is not condemned or speaking up, you know, against bad behavior is condemned or ridiculed. And it creates that stress where I'm working in an environment now where I'm afraid that I'm not going to be backed up. I'm afraid that I'm going to be uh, sidelined for, you know, promotion and things like that. And if we're not addressing those things again, from a leadership standpoint, um, we, we can't change the culture. It makes it okay for members of the culture to ridicule or sideline people who want to do the right thing and stand up to bad behavior. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Love. 
Uh, Professor Dotson, you, you, I, I know you've been patiently waiting with your hand up. I know your arm must be getting tired. So I'm gonna go. I'm gonna. I'm gonna have you ask your question. Yeah, I, I've got a couple directed to uh, two different individuals or set of individuals. Uh, to the to my police officer buddies and panelists, uh, especially you, Lou, and and, and Mr. Love. Uh, Chief Green from Lansing has uh, had tried to implement some of the policies that you heard about, some of the reforms that you talked about. When it came to minor traffic stops being prohibited, being prohibited as among his group of folks, and he got a bunch of pushback, blowback from from in from inside the police department. So I'm wondering, one, uh, how much how how uniform is any idea of reform within within the police department? One, and then two, I think the the uh, the legislators are going to have to get involved if there's going to be meaningful reform when it comes to qualified immunity. I didn't know if our, if our speaker spoke to the fact that there seems to be some kind of signal coming from the Supreme Court that they're looking at maybe doing some things or modifying the law, or maybe that is something that is just being suggested by the politicians. So if he could elaborate on that, I would appreciate it. Thanks. So, so I'd go to Mr. Savitt first. To, have you seen anything from the Supreme Court which would indicate uh, that, the, that there is a change in the analysis for qualified immunity in regards to a very different test than other areas of the law? Uh, you, you know, I do, I do think that there, there's been some separate writings with respect to qualified immunity, which I, which I think uh, indicate that the Supreme Court may be willing to revisit it. I don't think there's five votes, uh, five votes there yet. With respect to, to, to pretext stops, I, I, I will note that, um, uh, Justice Sotomayor has, uh, has has written separately uh, her her dissent in Utah versus Strafe. Strafe. Uh, uh, I don't know how you say that, but uh, it's, it's Utah. I know though. I, I know that word. Uh, I, I think really um, uh, really really called into question uh, Wren and its progeny. Uh, and Justice Ginsburg actually, in one of her final uh, separate concurrences, uh, indicated that she would be willing to reconsider uh, Wren, uh, which was uh, for what it's worth a nine nothing decision. So I think that there has been some movement at the Supreme Court level now, realistically, uh, you know, given the six, three conservative majority right now, uh, do I think that we're going to see anything, uh, a sea change in, in, in the law coming out of the Supreme Court of the United States? No, but what I will note is that state Supreme courts here are very uh, important too. When I mentioned uh, New Mexico and Washington uh, and how they in those states don't allow for, for pretext stops, uh, that was was as a result of uh, judicial opinions interpreting their Fourth Amendment analog in the state constitution. Uh, so, you know, I think as with so much else, uh, litigation that that uh, seeks to be more rights protective uh, right now probably is going to have a better shot at the state court level if you can, um, you know, find a find a hook at this in in a state constitution or or, or a state statute um, than at the Supreme Court of the United States. Uh, but but you know, at, at the end of the day, I, we're, we're we're here in Michigan. Uh, I you know I'm not aware of any any legal developments in Michigan that you know tilt in tilt in the way of uh, cutting back on qualified immunity or, or pretext stops. But um, uh, again, uh, locally elected prosecutors, um, uh, you know, folks on the ground, police departments, they can nevertheless say we're not doing this as a matter of uh, discretion, as a matter of policy, and as a matter of what uh, the communities they serve uh, ask for. Thank you, uh, Mr. Love and Mr. Langham. I guess you, I'd have you talk to uh, Professor Dotson's first question concerning: Isn't it hard for leaders to change an environment when there's pushback within the, the actual environment? Uh, that uh, I know that happened on some level in mid-Michigan, um, where these reforms were 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 spoken about, and then there was pushback from from traditional law enforcement on the ground. Uh, and I guess I'd have you speak to that. I'll make a brief comment. Um, yes, there's always going to be pushback, whether or not that pushback is coming from the unions, the police unions, or not. But the other thing is that you have. Uh, hundreds of police departments throughout the entire state of Michigan and in any other state. So, um, uh, you know, we're talking about a situation where every head of every law enforcement organization within a given state, are they going to all agree upon what should or shouldn't happen? That's not going to be the case. So um, my perspective is it, it, if it's not done 
in a legislative manner, it's, it's going to be very difficult because you have 100 plus police chiefs and uh, county sheriffs, state police, you have all the local police agencies, township and village uh, departments. That would make it very, very difficult to kind of streamline and get some um, basic standard um, uh, um, developed. Yeah, and I agree with I agree with that. Um, and it varies from from organization to organization, from department to department. Uh, you know, there are some chiefs out out there who are, um, you know, they're very committed to that, very committed to ensuring that that change is pushed throughout the organization. And is it hard? Yes, absolutely. Um, that's why we have a, a, a lot of chiefs who are are, are giving in. Uh, to some of the pressure, the scrutiny and things like that. But there are others who are standing up and doing what needs to be done to turn their department back in the right direction. Uh, again, police and community relations is paramount to our ability to effectively serve a community. And uh, if we don't have that, if that's broken down, then we're not going to be able to do our jobs effectively. So again, there are many chiefs out there who are very committed to that. And is it hard? Yes, absolutely. Tony, if you don't mind, I got one follow up to that. If you sure. Don't mind. Go we, ahead. Uh, come, we had a panel discussion at school coming off the uh, Ferguson situation, and there were panelists. I don't know, Tony, if you if you were involved, if you if you attended that, but th it was comprised of uh, people from the legal community, people from the police department, people from the defense community. I think there may have been a judge there too. One of the questions I asked was whether or not officers are are, are tested for PTSD. And the response was no, but we should be testing for PTSD. So on, on that, with that said, if if we can't wait on legislators to do what we want them to do in terms of reform, if we can't wait necessarily on police heads to do what they want to do, how can we screen better folks that might that might be inherently less likely to get into these issues that we find ourselves getting into more frequently? In other words, how do how do we get folks on the front end that might be more interested and capable of community relations, more willing to talk with people and deal with people unlike them, et cetera. How can that be part of the profile or part of the requirement when it comes to hiring in the first place? I'm gonna let Mr. Love talk to, the, to speak to that because I think I think there's some experience uh, concerning some of your background. Right, so we do run a, a battery of tests, uh, pre-employment psychological evaluations. Um, there are several organizations or agencies or clinicians that, that perform those throughout the state of Michigan, and, and it varies. Um, there are guidelines put out by MCOs and Michigan Commission on Law Enforcement Standards, but they are just that, guidelines. Guidelines put out by the, the International Association of Chiefs of Police. However, there are still some agencies out there who do not um, have formal psychological evaluations done uh, for pre-employment. And um, I think making that uh, mandatory. Now we get involved with HIPAA and Americans with Disabilities Acts and things like that. There are a lot of things that have to be done to make sure that all lines up. Um, but there are some departments that do a very good job of doing thorough background investigations and then a pre-employment psychological evaluation prior to uh, uh, that final hiring process or the final hiring of, of a candidate. So, uh, yeah, there's legislature, leg legislation, obviously, that has to be uh, done to make that happen, make it mandatory. But as of today, it, it is not. Uh, an agency simply has to ensure that a candidate is free of mental, emotional, and psychological instability. It just does not mandate how they are to ensure that. So, a lot of agencies get around it, and subsequently, uh, they pay and we pay. Mr. Love, I, I have a follow up to that because I think that's a good question, and I, I've talked about this with Professor Thotson on some level. The um, uh, we, the academies actually have sponsored individuals who go in who've already been hired by the department as long as they they the, as long as they pass the academy, and then you have your general academy members. But is this a test, or this, should this these testing be at the academy level to see if that person is worthy of going through the academy? Or is somebody that you consider spending time on at the academy level? Um, I'm not certain that that's done at any of our police academies in Mid Michigan, and I'm, 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 I'm you would know more about that than I. So I, I, I'd like to learn from you on that topic. No, I, I believe the academy actually gets candidates ready, you know, and and to have that shift in in their mentality or mindset. Um, you know, policing is is 
it is a profession that is very hard for people to understand. I always say you have to be it to get it. Um, there's so much involved in, in the job uh, of, of a police officer that you literally, you cannot explain it to someone. Um, so I think the academy uh, helps prepare a candidate for that, but when they are hired, um, and most of them are hired post academy, or sometimes they're sponsored to go to an, to an academy. But when they are hired, it's, it's, it's critical that there is a very thorough background investigation done because there are things that neighbors or family members may tell you that may not show up on a psychological evaluation. And that collateral information then should be used, which it is in most cases, to conduct that psychological evaluation, evaluation along with tests and a face-to-face -face clinical interview. So, you know, it has to be done, you know, at all phases and all stages. You know, so by the time a person actually gets into a field training program, they've been vetted so many times over that, you know, we most likely have a good candidate. I want to, I'm going to circle this conversation back to, because back to the nature of qualified immunity uh, as a doctrine that we follow. Um, and I, I guess I'd, I'd like to look from our panel members. There's been recent legislation which should indicate that law enforcement should be responsible if they use unreasonable force. That should be the standard. Uh, to, and, and on a case by case basis, on an unreasonable standard uh, 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 type of case. Um, do you, if, 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 I mean, and I go to uh, Professor Mitchell Seishan, if, we, if we're able, would that make a difference if we're able to change the qualified immunity test? It's an odd test to anybody who reads it, I, I, I think. Um, um, do you think that would make a difference in regards to law enforcement's behavior and training as to what is done in a very real and, and a very uh, uh, tangent experience at the ground level? Oh, that's, that's a tough one. I, I guess I always say to folks, if someone's a bad actor, they're a bad actor. Um, you know, if, if, if they come to the job intending to do some of the things that we see folks are getting sued for, right? So, um, I think the jury's out on that. And um, I don't, I don't think that would be enough. I think it's a good step in the right direction, but I think, you know, Brady material, and I see that in the chat, you know, Brady material, um, you know, why, why, why don't we have open discovery? Why isn't any, why aren't things evaluated? I mean, the file is the file. Uh, the government's file is the government's file. And often um, when Brady materials uncovered, again, it leads to some really bad results. Um, so if we can take the subjectivity out of that, I think it'll help. But if someone's going to, for example, if a police officer is going to encourage a witness to lie or fabricate evidence, um, qualified immunity standards won't correct that. The and, and then I, I I go to Mr. Love and Professor Langham, and then maybe end with Mr. Savitt. Uh, is 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 readjusting this test, or a, or the question is abolishing it? Do we abolish it? Do we change the test? in order to make people responsible for their behavior there are consequences that go to because some of this case law out there is just crazy i mean certain uh, the police officers steal during a search warrant and the court said well police officers never stole during a search warrant before so 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 obvious so obviously they're protected by qualified immunity i mean some of it just is is just doesn't make any sense so i guess my response to you is would an adjustment in the analysis of qualified immunity have some level of changing a culture of training and on the ground uh, work product so that so we could start to have some measurable change. I guess I'm asking Mr. Lovin and, and Mr. Langham that. Professor I, Langham. Yeah, I, I'll just make a quick comment. You know, just kind of trying to figure out and looking at the language and, and, and the law and the standard of review um, here, I think something that one might want to consider or look at. Um, as a legislator, uh, from a legislator's perspective, is it's not so much whether or not the police were justified in doing what it is they did, um, and, and qualified immunity protects them at that point. I think maybe it should be more of what they did, was it reasonable and necessary? You know, we're talking about de-escalation type processes, because police are 
with, when police fire their weapons, it's, it's always looked at, for example, as or chokeholds or whatever it happens to be, is whether or not they were justified in doing what it is they did. I'm thinking that to kind of balance it out a little bit, maybe it should be more of a, were the police tactics reasonable and necessary, thinking about a de-escalation situation, you know, should you have used your taser versus your gun and whether or not qualified immunity will apply or not. Yeah, but you know what you're doing there, you're eliminating qualified immunity altogether. Which is, and you and you and you are holding them account. You're holding them to the same standard that you or I would be held to on based on irresponsible or unreasonable conduct. Now that's 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 a that's a long that's that right. That perhaps is where we need to go. But just understand that you're underdoing you're undoing immunity altogether, and the whole basis for thinking that we need to have immunity in the first place. Right. What's, these are the, the these are the arguments that have been made, not by me necessarily, but these are the arguments that have been made because we're balancing the need to hold public officials accountable when they exercise uh, irresponsible or unreasonable excessive force in their authority, and we also need to have um, they they all, the police also need to have some protection which is what qualified immunity is, to shield them from excessive litigation, um, which would tie up the courts and not to mention any type of financial problems that they would occur. So I don't disagree with you at all, Professor Dotson, but the arguments, not my position, but the arguments that I have been exposed to from both sides, and those are some of the arguments that I've heard addressed. What's wrong with going back to the notion that, that this is a narrowly drawn uh Qualified immunity was supposed to be narrowly drawn and being and being given for good faith, and and then holding law enforcement to a re, to what a reasonable officer would do in the same situation, the same standard we have in other negligence, uh, uh, but instead we we have this 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 test where we're looking reflectively at what the courts considered as opposed to trying to look forward as to what the court should consider uh, in regards to specific actions. I guess that that is bothersome to me because, and I'd ask Mr. Sabbath this, Mr. Sabbath, you sound like you made this one small part of a bigger plan, which I I completely understand. But it, the, the, how how do you how do you change this part? Is it the test, or is it abolishment, or is it uh, using it as 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 another form of tort liability standard that we can use? Uh, yeah, I, I, I favor, I personally favor uh, narrowing the standard. I, I, I do understand um, the, uh, the, the, the rationale, the original rationale behind qualified immunity, which again is not just for uh, police officers, but, but for government officials generally, which is that you, 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 you can't just be constantly uh, in fear that a decision that you make uh, is is going to lead to uh, liability. If you if you do that, then then you're going to be paralyzed and make no decision at all, which can sometimes be be uh, the worst possible outcome. And 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 look, I have some I have sympathy for the fact that that officers are on the ground; they need to make split second decisions, and sometimes you know things may not be as they seem. So. Uh, I favor narrowing the standard. It has just gone, in my view, uh, much too far. I mean, encompassing what is clearly unreasonable. And I think, uh, you know, if you would just ask the, the 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 a person on the street, like, is this unconstitutional? They'd say, yeah, obviously, and, and probably most judges would too in some of these cases. But again, they never get to that point because qualified immunity checks um, uh, the development of of the law. So, so uh, you know, I think the right solution is to narrow the doctrine, not to get rid of it entirely. Entirely. And I and I will say that one uh, one thing that we don't want to to do is discourage people from going into government service. If you if you fear that uh, any mistake, I mean, we all make mistakes at our job, right? Um, uh, and any mistake is going to subject you to liability and a, and a lawsuit or whatever. Why bother? Why go into government uh, service? You, you you'd, you'd be more likely to go into a profession where you know a mistake is a mistake and it doesn't necessarily lead to uh, a civil lawsuit. So for all those reasons that. You know, I, I I I get the genesis of it, but I think that the 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 scope of it and the test needs to be dramatically uh, narrowed and changed. Any comments on that? We we have some questions that are that are looking a little broader, and and we have one question from Mr. Love, who's who's who um, I think uh, 
your background and your law enforcement experience make you make it such an interesting uh, uh, and uh, students are interested in this impl implicit bias culture and 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 you and and so you you, you counsel on things of this nature. So um, how do you how how do you do that based on your experience? I mean it, it, that that seem that would be that would seem so ref reflective in nature. And and you're you're trying to get your through your counseling uh, a, a a different cultural perspective, so to speak. Yeah, for me, so I, I grew up in Detroit, uh, you know, northwest side of the city, and I was subjected to a lot of the negative treatment that that we hear people talk about. And, you know, and when I say I was a good kid, I was a good kid, okay? And most of the guys I ran around with were good kids. My, my mother saw to it. But we were subjected to the same negative behavior that those who were causing trouble were subjected to simply because we lived in the neighborhood. So, you know, a lot of people from the city has a chip, you know, have a chip on their shoulder or, or they're afraid of the police, all that. And I explained to officers, and when I was working at the Detroit Post with the state police, when troopers came in from outside of the area, I explained that you're going to run into people who may seem like they have a chip on their shoulder. Let me explain to you and help you understand where that chip comes from. All right. And it is your responsibility. I think we have an, a, a moral responsibility and a civic duty to change that person's perception of law enforcement. All right. By showing them what the nobility of policing is all about. By showing them that we are here to serve and protect, you know, and demonstrate that. And if we do that enough, then we change people's perception and we don't have this, this fear and this animosity and things like that. I don't think any police officer comes uh, into the profession to go to work for 8, 10, 12 hours a day in an adversarial environment. I help them understand that you have a platform and responsibility and, and, and ability to change that perception, change that environment that you're working in. I have a I have a question for the panel and anybody who wants to participate. Um, it comes from an anecdote that happened to me as I was training uh, law enforcement officers who I worked with. One of his children was in the academy, and he graduated from the academy. And I saw him at a Home Depot, and uh, and I and I said, "Hey, I had your kid in the academy." And he looked at me, he's a detective, and we, we exchanged pleasantries. And he said, you had my kid in the academy. I told that kid to be a fireman. <laughs> he never listened to me anyway. If we're changing the test of qualified immunity, is it going to have a chilling effect on those who are going into law enforcement? Are there other roads that they believe would be a, a, uh, a, a safer occupation for them? Will we be losing good people? Or is that the price you pay for for having a real test of consequence? I guess I'd go to Marla first for that, Professor Mitchell Seishan. Uh, Professor Dotson, feel free to weigh in on that and anybody else. Well, I think that's always a risk, but I think um, again, if if we're talking about changing the definition, the legal definition, and not getting rid of qualified immunity altogether. Um, again, it, it, as long as the guidelines about, you know, again, what reasonable behavior is, um, is as long as things are well defined, I don't think it will dissuade good people from going into this profession. Um, and I think people want guidance. They, they do want that. And I think, um, really it just goes after what Mr. Love said. I mean, really it's. It's it has to go on both sides of the table. There has to be a change in the perception in some communities of the police officers, right? Um, so there's implicit bias on both sides of the table. But um, certainly, um, you know, the way to overcome that is frankly not. I don't think laws. I think it's it's exactly what Mr. Love is talking about, right? That uh, officers who are passionate about work. Um, we, I know there's probably a lot of law students at this event, right? I mean, most of you are going to become lawyers because you have a passion for some area of the law and you want to give to your community. And that's what a, a good police officer wants. And as citizens, we want the police officers in our community to have that attitude and we want to reciprocate it. So I don't think it will dissuade people. And I think actually we see nationally that people are crying out for that. People are crying out for uh, accountability, um, again, that Mr. Love mentioned earlier. 
And I think that's the direction we must move in. Yeah, and I believe, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I believe that's all true, but I be, believe also it will absolutely dissuade um, good, good people from becoming police officers. Um, just the thought or the belief that they're going to be overly scrutinized and that sort of thing. That doesn't mean that they are, but the reality is that we have officers out there now. You look at some of the chiefs who have quit uh, because of scrutiny that came upon them because of something one of their departmental members did. I have officers who come into my office, 25-year veterans who never harmed a flea, yet they are horrified that they may not make it to their retirement because something's going to come down on them um, because of a mistake they made and that sort of thing. Okay, so again, just the reality is that, yes, it will dissuade people, but we also have to make sure that, again, we're going back to what is right, you know, uh, what does it mean to serve and protect and, you know, doing the right thing all the time that, you know, that practical wisdom that comes with experience and with the proper teaching to ensure that you are doing the right thing all the time, ensuring that you are protecting and upholding people's constitutional rights instead of violating them. If we do that, and there are many officers who know that that's how they conduct themselves, they're not concerned. Um, so it's it's kind of all across the board. You have some that have never done anything, but they're horrified. You have others who are doing things and they're horrified, and you have others who've never done anything and they say, bring it on. I'm going to do what I know to do. I'm going to serve. I'm going to protect because this is who I am. I guess I, I can talk to Lou because I know I know Professor Langham's son is a is a is a state police trooper. So he's got he he kind of answers the he answers the, the question from a professor and from a parent. And you're on mute. You're on mute, Lou. Yeah, that rarely happens. <laughs> I heard that, Professor Dotson. <laughs> so mute, I can still hear. I just want you to know that. Um, yeah, my son is, in fact, a, a state trooper, and he's been in the department for, for two years. So, question. Would he have not gone into the state police had qualified immunity vanished? Good question. I think he would have gone in, but as soon as he saw people around him having deciding to leave and getting in trouble because there's no qualified immunity, I think he might have might consider changing professions. So um, it, it, it's a tough call. It's a really tough call because police run into trouble. I mean, I cannot imagine. I, I guess I was lucky. I never, 25 years in the state police, I never had any incidents involving excessive force, but Fourth Amendment violations or anything. Um, but that doesn't mean it couldn't have come up, but I just had, I had no problems with that, but that, you know, 25 years, it's kind of hard to have a, uh, be in law enforcement for 25 years and nothing come up. People are going to complain. And I think it would have some type of negative effect on, uh, those who join the force. So again, where is that balance? I don't necessarily have the answer, but there needs to be some type of balance and and police officers do need some type of protection yeah i i think though the question i think the, the time is right for reconsidering you you qualify you condition your your question or your comment tony on good police officers uh lou i think you hit it man you said you never had an issue and maybe what we need to do is is try to is try to identify more lou langham's or Professor Langham's and these other folks, or the Chauvin's or these other folks that we're having issues with. It does, it, we're talking about qualified immunity, and that's not an issue when it comes to a lawsuit. It doesn't prevent anybody internally from, from, from being subjected to discipline either way. Even the, 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 the police department can support the police officer, even in the event of a lawsuit, if, if, it, if, it, if it believes that the police officer acted in conformance with good police practices. The police department does not have to wait on a lawsuit to otherwise discipline a police officer or relieve that police officer of his responsibility. So it gets back to us perhaps reconsidering exactly what good police work is. And, uh, and, and I hope that that's part of the discussion that's being had among police departments. And if it means, if it means that some people are going to be, if we're going to lose good people as previously identified or, or defined as good people, then so be it. But I've got to think there are enough 
replacements available that are willing to to adhere to or conform to what this new generation is looking for. No, I think that's I think that's well stated. I do have some fear that, and I think uh, in the chat someone indicated this, and I do see some of this is that uh, what the candidates that were available 20 years ago are not the candidates that are available now. Uh, and that and and I think I think most academies would would agree on that. That doesn't mean the test is right, though. I mean, it doesn't mean that a test that is looking for clearly behavior that was exactly the same before indicates whether something's qualified immunity or not just seems seems somewhat crazy to me. And that's why I, I was I, that's why I'm looking at consequences for cultural change on some level. And this is one part of that. Uh, the, the Supreme Court's had available to itself a fair warning doctrine, which in, indicates that that law enforcement would have fair warning that what they're doing is wrong. So they don't get to hide under the qualified immunity exception. I and mean, if you're tasing somebody three times because you think it's funny, that, then you have fair warning that that's an assault and battery. That's a common law crime and that you should be you should be held accountable. Those kind of things I think are available. Those tools are available to change the analysis structure. So there'll be consequences for behavior. Because one of my fears right now is that the general public doesn't believe there's consequences, at least civil consequences, not, not to mention criminal consequences, which is also talked about in the chat, criminal consequences for law enforcement behavior. And I, I think that's the struggle right now as we go through reform is that that there would be a lot there would be better feeling by the general public if they felt that law enforcement was accountable on some level that's not to say that there isn't good law enforcement out there but it is to say that that there's that that is that is polarized part of this discussion in reality because those people don't believe that law enforcement criminally or civilly are held accountable for things that they do how do we fix that I think one way we fix that is to address this test. And then I'd let anybody comment on, on that also. Well, I, I'll make a comment. I, I, I would say that, you know, yes, the test should be looked at and, and, and some adjustments should be made. And I would also comment that there are lots of good police officers out there, uh, a whole lot. Um, yeah, there's some bad things happening out there by, by several police officers all over the country. They have happened. And there is a lot of airplay on those things. And some of them are not prosecuted. Some of them are not dealt with in the right way. But the majority, we have to remember, the majority of the law enforcement officers out there and departments are out, who are out there are doing a good job. And they are uh, upholding and um, protecting, you know, those civil liberties that we all have under, under the Constitution. Um, so, yeah, some adjustments definitely need to be made. Most... I would say that, well, you know, I'm not going to say that because I don't know, I don't have anything to back it up. But I was going to say that most bad acts, you know, or criminal acts by police officers are being dealt with. Um, you know, that's what I believe. But again, I said I'm not going to say that because I don't have anything to back it up. But um, it, there's uh, there's more good being done out there by police officers than than bad. I'll just make it that simple statement right there. Mr. Savage, I'd, I'd like to, oh, I'd like to. Oh, go ahead, Mark. Can you can you can you for for the students? Can, we hear a lot about the police unions. Can you can you describe generally how these police unions operate, especially when it comes to uh, disciplining police officers, and why we see so many occasions where where we we hear about after the fact a police officer being being uh, uh, challenged being criticized, being reported, et cetera, multiple times, yet still allowed to exist on the police on the police force and 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 and, and how that might end up being uh, a point where 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 a real change has to start. Well as a as a former captain, um, I poor leadership on the union side and poor leadership you know, on the management side, management side of the department. Uh, if you've got a union leader who is condoning bad behavior and whatever it takes to get you off and get you to keep your job, then that's bad leadership, okay? And so from a union standpoint, you've got some good ones out there who make sure they're holding their people accountable and helping them to, to, to stay on track. 
and not fall by the wayside. And you have some who by any means necessary, I'm gonna get you off of this. And sometimes, you know, when it comes to bargaining for things within a department, um, that comes into play. And those relationships between the management and the, and the union leader are strong. And again, if you've got good leaders on both sides, then the right things will be done. But if you don't, that's when we have problems. And I think that, that's what we see uh, most of the time in, in that environment. When, when we have things going bad, it, it's, it's bad leaders on both sides. And those, those relationships are very strong. And Tony, can I comment on that? Sure, please. Uh, I mean, this is a thing in my work, okay? The same bad actor is acting bad in multiple cases. And sometimes there are internal complaints and nothing happens. So this is really, really important. Professor Dotson's question um, is, is critically important to, um, to making some changes here. Do do those changes those changes would have to become would have to come from law enforcement? I mean, those have to be those have to those have those have to be cultural changes. I guess my question for Mr. Savitt, who's a, an elected prosecutor, is two twofold. One is, in order to do this as elected prosecutor, you need agency help. You need to get the departments on board to understand that this is not a this is not a, a pro defendant thing. This is a, a pro law enforcement thing. I understand that. The second thing that I think is really interesting that has come up is uh, is our resource. We've we've gotten to this notion of of where to put resources and calling it something other than just putting resources in different places. I guess it's a twofold question, but I'd ask you as lead elected prosecutor, how do you get law enforcement to work in this system to understand it as you see it, and then second. How do you explain to them that resources need to, may need to be changed or maybe not be changed uh, in regard to that in, in in regard to that that theory that you that you have? Of course, I'm muted. Uh, <laughs> um, so 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 there's so, so there's a couple of things. Uh, number one, I I just think that uh, there there's a huge divide right now um, between a lot of uh, activists and folks who are uh, advocating for criminal justice reform and law enforcement. And I think a lot of people in law enforcement feel demonized. They feel as though they're being, um, you know, the entire profession is being scapegoated for uh, high profile actions uh, that they don't agree with. And I, and I get that. And I do not think, I really do not think that we want to send the message that all police are bad, all law enforcement is bad, uh, uh, because what happens then? We are going to lose out on the very people that we would want to be police officers. We should want the best. We should want people that have a equity perspective on this and understand, um, you know, the the awesome power that police have and the good that it can do, but also the harm that it can do if if exercised inappropriately. We want those people as police officers. So I think that you know, look, there's there's no other way of doing this other than coming to the table together. Uh, you know, I. I I, I really wish one of the one of the things that frankly I uh, really am uh, saddened by when uh, with respect to when I took over uh, in early 2021 uh, is that we still have this this COVID pandemic and it prevents a lot of face to face meetings. What I've found is that there's a lot of law enforcement officers that uh, much like there's a lot of prosecutors that uh, uh, you know actually believe in a lot of this stuff. Um, but you can't bring them to the table by demonizing their whole profession um, by just yelling at them across the the the, the sort of the sort of chasm. Uh, that's going to have, uh, I think, the um, uh, the the opposite effect of what we want. So there, there's no other way of doing this other than having real, frank, and candid conversations. I think that there are, are law enforcement officers that many law enforcement officers that are that are willing to listen because because more than anybody, I think a lot of law enforcement officers they want to have the trust of the communities that they serve. But it's got to be something that brings people together for you know exchange of ideas and respectful conversations, not something in which in which one side is demoning demonizing the the other. And that's actually really how we tried to go about our transition because I you know I ran 
on a platform or a form. But, um, you know, before I started putting out policies, uh, you know, when I won the primary in August, uh, we put together these working groups and we invited every uh, sort of law enforcement uh, agency in, in, in the county to, to have people on our working groups. And, and uh, we're really fortunate that uh, our sheriff put a lot of folks on, on the working groups. We had Ann Arbor Police Department, Saline Police Department that are represented on the, on the working groups. And, and, and really, like, you, you can you can work together on on this stuff and frankly uh, law enforcement's perspective is 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 really invaluable i started off with some things that i was like planning on doing and they'd say well what about this that i saw on the ground the other day and what do you want and I'd say, oh you know i never i never really thought about that um and so so we should definitely address that in the policy but it's got to be a dialogue we, we we can't just keep yelling uh at each other quite frankly i say that as somebody that comes from uh the political left and has been, has been in a lot of protests um i think that you know we, we need to have conversations uh with folks person to person um and and that's the way to move forward with with change now in terms of reallocating resources i think it's kind of the same thing. Uh, you, you know, you, you talk to a lot of officers and what they really want at the end of the day is they want to come home safely at the end of the evening. And, um, you know, they're being asked to respond to mental health crises that frankly, they're, they're, it's not their job to do. Um, uh, you know, we've, we've made it their job to do it, but that's because we've cut back on mental health uh, funding in this, in this state and in this country over the course of decades. Um, and that puts everybody in um, uh, in, in harm's way, uh, including the officer. Uh, so, so, so again, I think that, you know, there, there is a lot that, uh, common ground that, uh, can be found in this, but we've just got to have the conversations respectfully and, and, you know, extend olive branches to, 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 to folks that, you know, uh, may, may not agree with us at, at the outset so we can find that common ground. Thank you, Mr. Savitt. I, I, I've seen, I've seen a couple comments and I, I guess I'm looking for, uh, for law enforcement experience here, but there does seem to be uh, a uh, in in the ch in the chat this issue of that this binding arbitra the arbitrator and the role that the arbitrator plays in law enforcement and 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 coming to a decision as to whether somebody has has done something wrong or right maybe where there's um, there's a decision made. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure. I am qualified to speak to that as, as a pros, as a prosecutor. I'd look to Professor Langham or to Professor or to Mr. Love or to anybody else who would like to speak to that. This is this is a topic that would be interesting to our students. Uh, this 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 notion of arbitration in a law enforcement setting, and I don't know if we know a lot about that. So I'll turn it over to Professor Langham first, and then Mr. Love to to see if you can answer any of those questions. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll, I'll try to tackle it first. Yes, so sometimes when the arbitrator, um, you know, the arbitrator comes in and, and, and it's, it's obviously it's a neutral party of sorts in trying to make a determination between the, um, the agency and the um, police official who's involved in whatever the controversy happens to be. Um, you know, um, it depends on how that ruling comes out and whether or not who's, who's happy about it. Um, what I... But we have to have something like that. I was the command officers association representative when I was in the state police, um, you know, and, and making sure the policies and procedures that are, are being followed when an officer is charged with something or some issue involving the department that they did do or didn't do. Um, but in the, in the long run, I, you know, I just think a decision has to be made by someone that's a, a neutral person because you have management on one side, you have the union on the other side, and you need someone in the middle to kind of make a decision. Um, just to add this one little um, point here too is, and, and, I, and, and it goes back to our conversation about maybe about four or five minutes ago. Um, you know, if a police officer does something tragically wrong, illegal in California, Police officers in Michigan are going to suffer for that um, because it's not looked at as a local issue anymore. It's looked at as a broader issue, and that doesn't help. So it's like every time a police officer does something wrong somewhere else, every police officer is going to have a, a, a you know, suffer some type of public, um, I don't want to say humiliation, but some type of public um, problem. Um, from the public looking how they look at them. It's like, you guys are all alike. You ladies are all alike. And that wraps up everybody. It wraps up the good police officers that we talked about, um, which makes up most of the police departments throughout this country. But 
one bad apple in one department, we talk about these things, it affects all other officers in other areas too. So Harold, uh, maybe you have some, some, some different information as it relates to arbitration that you can add to us, add to the conversation. Yeah, so, yeah, thanks Lou. Uh, and yes, uh, there are many times where the disciplinary process runs its course and then there's always the option for arbitration at the end. And sometimes a person, I've seen people fired, terminated, and then um, the arbitrator makes a decision to give them their jobs back. Uh, and that ties the hands of the Department of Management. And sometimes even, you know, when the union supported that because they said, we don't have a leg to stand on, you messed up, you've got to suffer the consequences. And then uh, at the end, an arbitrator uh, has the authority to, to, to give a person his job back and overrule that final decision. So we see that from time to time, and that does obviously tie the hands of the department to deal or get get rid of a bad apple. I Sorry, think that's it, it, I think it, that's important every for people to know uh, that 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 this is a process. Uh, go go ahead go ahead whoever was talking. That was me, Tony. It, it, I, when I worked in the in city attorney's office, I got a chance to be exposed to the collective bargaining process, and that's where it starts. And Mr. Savvy kind of touched upon it when we talked about uh, how we get to these situations where we have bad results or bad rules or bad policies and it's, and it's management and and the department trying to come to some kind of compromise on the front end in the collective bargaining agreement. Uh, arbitration is only a product of, of, a, of a process and and they can control what that process would be on the front end as they negotiate what, what the collective bargaining, bargaining agreement is gonna look like. Mr. Savage, you mentioned earlier that uh, I ended up reading an article about some of the reforms that you had instituted and sharing it with Professor Martin Scott. And she said, oh, he did that. I said, yeah, how about that? I'm curious as to how the public responded to your reform measures. Not, not necessarily the police department, but the public generally. How did they, what kind of response did you get to your reform? Yeah, yeah. So, 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 by and large, the response has been uh, quite positive. Which, which, in in no small part, is because you know I was I was honest about what I uh, was running on, and I and I ran on, you know, for example, with cash bail, I ran very strongly on never seeking cash bail in uh, in a case. And I think it behooves, you know, if 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 we're going to be moving towards change, you know, you you've got to be honest with the voters. Uh, I think that, uh, and we had a, a nearly two year long campaign with really robust community conversation, and I think a. Lot Lot of minds changed around criminal justice reform because part of the um, part, part of the thing that, that that I found is that you know uh, everybody on here is is an expert or uh, in some way or or another uh, in the criminal legal system, but a lot of people just don't uh, you know don't have occasion to think about the nuances of the criminal legal system if they're not um, uh, you know either a lawyer or you know a defendant or or uh, you know a victim in a case. Uh, so so I think having these community conversations is is uh, really the only way uh, to build community support for it because you know a lot of people just don't know what cash bail is, for example. But if you talk to them, you say, "Well, look, what that means is that somebody's held in jail before they were convicted of anything until uh, they paid some money." Don't, don't you think that rich people should shouldn't have the same uh, should have the same sort of justice as poor people? And most people say, "Well, yeah. Why should how much money is in your bank account determine your freedom?" Um, but yeah, you got to have those conversations uh, a lot of the time uh, because you know uh, why would you know what cash bail is if you if uh, uh, it had never affected you, or you're not a lawyer, you're not an expert in 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 the space. But by and large, it's, it's been going uh, uh, about as well as I could expect. I think. Thank you, Mr. Savitt. I, I will say that if you've been in my class, we've talked a lot about cash bail because I get angry and I just spout off about it. So uh, it's because it, 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 it just doesn't make any sense to me. I do want to go to one last because uh, we got off track a little bit, but I'm 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 good going off track. Um, Mr. Stevenson, are you out there? Because I, I know that you had. I think our students could learn from uh, from the arbitration system that that you, you that we've had some discussion on. Uh, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Uh, those that don't know me, it's Robert Stevenson, the executive director with the Michigan Association of Chiefs of Police. And the thing I'd like to add to that arbitration discussion, especially for your students, is the process is that uh, everybody has a right to arbitration and. The unions avail themselves of that, and they take the arbitrator from a panel of suggested arbitrators. The city picks, the uh, union picks, and then they narrow it down, and then they choose the arbitrator that will hear the case. 
Because of that, what happens is the livelihood of the arbitrator rests upon them being able to be chosen again. And because of that, they often tend to split the baby. And what happens is they put bad police officers back to work. I could tell you horror stories from around the state of police chiefs that have fired police officers for just some offenses you wouldn't believe. And an arbitrator ultimately puts them back to work again because they have an interest in splitting the baby. So what other states have done is they have changed this arbitration process to where people need to be pre-qualified as arbitrators and they go into a panel and they're chosen and now their job and their future livelihood is not based upon being a splitter of the facts so they get chosen again. And uh, our association has advocated for that, but there's little stomach in Lansing to attack arbitration at this point in time. But that's a very simple change that could be made and other states have done that to change the arbitration process. Thank, thank you. I, I think it's so important that there's so many processes here that could go to reform that could be effective uh, with a little movement uh, and, and, and with some education on this. Uh, don't get me started on, on Professor Mitchell Seichen saying train, education, train, train, education. It's so true. I do want I do want to ask our panel finally uh, one question because we have uh, we have a lot of law students here and what 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 can they do what can our law students do to get involved to get a, to be a part of this process to uh, to uh, to if they're interested in it what can they do to to uh, to to start making measurable change as law students who are going to be young lawyers. And I'll start with Marla first, because I know you you work with the, our law students in the clinic. So I'll start with you. I think I think our um, our speaker um, really hit this home run on this. It's it's actually listening, guys, listening to people who are on the other side of the table politically. They have different jobs. They have different cultures. They have different backgrounds. Listening, that is the key to change. Um, and I guess the second thing is trust, getting people to trust you so that you can sit across from the table and disagree vehemently. I have just, I, I always like to say, and I know I'll get a couple of chuckles out of this, that I, when I started doing legislative reform work, I determined and realized very quickly that my lawyering skills were of no use to me in working with legislators. And it's kind of a joke, but it's it's really true. Um, they didn't care about what I was advocating. I needed to come to the table and be willing to listen and to listen to all the constituents that they have to listen to to get real change. So, and we could, we really need to be listening to each other right now because most cops are great cops and some cops are real, real bad cops. And that's who we really want to not have qualified immunity. Those are the cops we want to be fired. Those are the cops that we want these things to happen to, but it's not a blanket approach. You have to listen and be willing to, you know, hear some tough stories on all sides of the table. Mr. Love, I'll, I'll go to you next. And Mr. Love, you're on mute. Yep, I agree with the professor. Um, the same thing, we have to engage uh, and interact with people. That's how we increase our level of competence with any culture or any group is interacting with individuals from that group. And until we do that, I think we rob ourselves of an opportunity to to grow ourselves, to become more more competent, to uh, you know enhance our, our worldview, all of that. Uh, we have to interact with people, understand, and then put your foot forward to to do something about it. You know, make the changes that are necessary uh, to to level the playing field, so to speak, uh, in, in, increase equity. Professor Langham. Yes, I, I for. For the law students out there uh, in the audience, um, and and you've done this before because I've participated in these type of events before. It's where the it's where the law students, and, and this is obviously going to be as the prosecutor mentioned, uh, COVID is kind of in the way of some of these things. Is getting law enforcement and the community in the same room together when nothing bad is going on, because when something bad is going on, they are talking at each other. 
And it's always accusatory one way or the other. So I think that after we get through this COVID situation and people start getting back together, um, I think the law students can be very helpful. And, and for one reason, you're closer to the age of a lot of people that law enforcement come in contact with in these altercations that they have. And getting together with the community and your age group of sorts um, and getting law enforcement involved and putting all of them in the same room at the same time to have a conversation when all hell isn't breaking loose. And I think that would go a long way and uh, uh, having people learn to speak to each other instead of shouting at each other. Professor Dotson, do you want to add to that? I know you've been vocal in this and you certainly know our students as well as anybody. Yeah, uh, we. I, 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 every time I see something like this, I can't tell you how hard I am. Because this this is a great turnout for Thursday night, uh, and and I I can see you guys are passionate about this stuff. And I, for a guy like me that went through the riots in the '60s and the '70s, and and seen all these all these responses, these public responses, and, uh, and to to events, the one thing I just would want, I would hope, and you kind of you kind of triggered it, um, Tony, with your with your question, the way you phrased it. The one thing you want to do is is if so whatever you can do to avoid being here 5, 10, 15 years from now, and we're having the same panel discussion all over again. So look, look to see what you can do. Step out there and do something that, that that's meaningful and it's not just necessarily cosmetic uh, pro, or performer or something like that. And and I, I'm confident the people that I'm looking at anyway, that you got it in you to go ahead and do it. And just know by virtue of your training, by virtue of the diploma, degree, the background, but more important, your conviction, your commitment to to reform is what's going to make all the difference in the world. Thank you, Mark, uh, Professor Dotson, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Savitt, uh, do you have any 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 words for our students concerning uh, this topic and the topic of social reform, social justice reform? You know, I think the, I think the, the the panel has covered it covered it really well. Uh, you know, I would just say, uh, you know, stay stay true to what you believe in. Uh, stay passionate uh, if you're passionate about this work. Uh, I think uh, you know we we are really in a very positive way of rethinking our criminal legal system uh, right now. But 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 always remember that you know it takes it takes building alliances um you know the change happens through um sort of consensus building and expanding our coalition so stay true to what you believe in um but you know remember uh that that, that uh, successful movement is about growth i'm going to put professor cooney on the spot who is the law review uh faculty editor uh, member um, do you have anything to say? I, I've, I've really, I'm with Mark Dotson. This has been a pleasure to be a part of. Uh, it's been um, more of this needs to happen, so to speak. Uh, so thank you, Mark, and thank you to the Law Review. Uh, did you have anything to say? I do. First, I want to thank you, Tony, Professor Flores, I should say. Uh, I want to thank all of our speakers. Thank you so much for giving us your time and your insights. Uh, it's, it's been such, a, such an informative evening. Uh, thank you to all the law review students uh, for for being here and for working on this. But I especially, I have to say a special thanks to Katrina Davis and uh, Silvana Reed. You you've seen firsthand here. These are such amazing people with such vision. I'm so proud, and uh, uh, I'd love to steal their steal the credit for all their hard work, uh, but I won't. Uh, so thank you, thank you very much, Katrina. Thank you very much, Silvana, and, and everybody on the law review team that worked on this. I, I would thank you. Thank you, Professor Cooney. And this this has been, you know, a, a pleasure to moderate. I will leave you with one uh, with one thought that I'm stealing from Pro Professor uh, 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 Seichen Mitchell. Uh, and I will tell you, young lawyers, if you see somebody say something smart, steal it because there's no there's no copyright on it. Take it, use it, pretend it's yours. Uh, if you want to give them credit, go ahead. I do sometimes, sometimes I don't. Uh, I come to this in a, from a very particular and different aspect, as we all do from a, whatever framework we came from. But uh, I was told at a very young age in, in the Phoenix neighborhood that I lived in to run from law enforcement. If you see police, you run. That, that's what I was taught at a very young age. And now, as an, as a, after 15 years as assistant prosecutor and 15 years as an academic, 
I've worked with law enforcement. They are some of the finest people I've ever met in my life. They truly are. They're wonderful people. They run towards problems, not away from problems. It is that it's that education, it's that experience that 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 listening and spending time with people that brought me to where I am today, which is I understand. I think we have a problem test and we have a lot of ways to go. We need a lot of we have a lot of measurable movements to make, but we don't get there unless we do this, unless we discuss, unless we talk, unless we spend time together. And with that, I will thank everybody for coming. It's been a wonderful experience for me. I hope you learned something today and uh, and good luck and stay safe. Please stay safe. And Tony, if I could add one thing to that, they like to talk to you. When you see a police officer, go up to them and talk to them. Uh, you can talk to, especially you law students, you can talk to them about something that you just learned in criminal procedure or whatever else, but they they have all, there has not been one occasion when I've approached a police officer uh, let them know exactly who I am and where I'm coming from, that they haven't been willing to talk about whatever I wanted to talk about. So uh, give it a shot and see, and, and you might learn something yourself about them. They will certainly learn something about you. Thank you, Mark. Well, that wraps it up. All right, have, have, a, good, have a good Thursday night and enjoy your night. Thank you very much. Thanks, bye everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you for coming. Wonderful work, everybody.